Hello. So uh, today's speaker, our speaker is Anne-Marie Bowman from uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, the title of her talk is Assembly in Algebraic A Theory of Lower E Theory. I hope I said it correctly, Lower E Theory, <laughs> the name. I, Please, I, Anne-Marie. I always say Lavier theory, is that? Olivia, okay, thank you for <laughs> I was not. <laughs> well, I'm just copying other people. So, you know, uh, who knows? Anyway, thank you so much Copy for the presentation, Katya, and, and thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, as it says, yes, I'm going to talk about assembly in the algebraic K theory of Lavier theories. Um, and I would start by saying this work is joint with Marcus Schimmick of uh, University of Sheffield. Um, so I, I want to start. I know that like this is a this is a broad audience, and so I want to start by by saying some things about algebraic K theory, how I think about it, um, and then I'll introduce Lavier theories and talk about the algebraic K theory of Lavier theories, and then the results about uh, assembly maps um, in this context. So that's that's a brief outline of where I'm planning to go here. Um, so algebraic K theory it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, I want to think about it, algebraic K theory, uh, as a really important invariant of rings. So, uh, how should we think about that? Um, well, if you have a ring, so R is a ring, then algebraic K theory is supposed to you're supposed to take the algebraic K theory and get a bunch of um, abelian groups, K n of R for for every n. These are abelian groups. And they're supposed to capture some information about your ring. Uh, so these like, you know, have info about your ring. And there's a whole bunch of connections to all sorts of cool things. So there's connections to uh, geometric topology via things like, you know, manifolds and s cobordism things like that. I mean, so here we're thinking like maybe my ring is the group ring of the fundamental group of a manifold or something like that. Um, there's also connections to number theory. Uh, you can see things like the ideal class group, your ring. Um, so, And, and important connections to things like the quillen lichtenbaum conjectures uh, are, can be phrased in terms of algebraic K theory. Uh, it is hard to spell Lichtenbaum, apparently. Um, <clears throat> so I want to think that, that you know, algebraic K theory is a sort of the basic idea is you have some ring and you, you get this sequence of abelian groups that captures information about your ring. Um, and there's a lot of structure on the sequence as well. Uh, just as a sort of historical background, so in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the first couple of these abelian groups, K0 and K1, were defined purely algebraically, uh, just using sort of algebraic data from your ring. <clears throat> um, but the general definition for all n is, is really a topological definition, and this is due to Quillen. Um, the general definition due to Quillen says, like, how should you define these? You should say, well, Kn of R, for your ring R, this is going to be defined as the nth homotopy groups, nth homotopy group of some space, which we'll call K of R. So here, K of R is a K theory space. And, and in fact, uh, it's, it's better than just sort of a random space. This is in fact an infinite loop space, um, which means that it, it, this is a space that's loops, that's n-fold loops on some other space for every different n. <clears throat> and such spaces are also, you know, the, the zero spaces of what are called spectra, which are the main object of study in algebraic topology and represent cohomology theories. So this is an infinite loop space or maybe we'll call it a, a spectrum. Um, <clears throat> so, so either way. And you know, how do you get this space? Well, it's a little complicated, um, but these, these higher K groups, uh, so these higher K theory groups 
there and this space is really built out of um, the data of you can have your pick. You can either take free or you can take projective modules uh, over R. So it's built out of this category. Um, and they're automorphisms of these, these modules. So, right, so that's like, you know, GL, N of R for, for different ends. Those are the, the automorphisms here. And in some sense, uh, one of what one of the things that this algebraic K theory is designed to do is it it captures some stuff about the like the stable homology of these automorphisms of these GLNs. So it captures the stable homology of you know GL infinity of R. So that's that's maybe part of its job, part of the the, the motivating ideas for Quillen that allow him to come up with these definitions. So <clears throat> it's a, a brief overview of some of the many aspects of algebraic K theory. One aspect I wanna highlight is a particularly nice piece of structure in algebraic K theory, and that's that of assembly maps. So this is a nice structure that we have in algebraic K theory. Um, and in particular, you know, this, this gives us another form of connections to um, say geometry or maybe group theory, depending on what you want. So this is via assembly maps. And there's, there's a whole bunch of um, related ideas that go under the name of assembly maps. Here, I wanna think about uh, a Lodet style assembly map, which, is going to be a map from the K theory of Z smashed with the suspension spectrum of the classifying space of your favorite group. It's a map from there to the K theory of the group ring over Z of your favorite group. So this is a low day assembly. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, these kinds of assembly maps, I mean, they, together with a whole bunch of uh, closely related generalizations have all sorts of connections to a whole lot of different things, connections to you know, the Farrell-Jones conjecture and the Novikov conjecture and the bump kahns conjecture, all sorts of this family of maps and their, their generalizations have a lot of impact. Um, the main question, I mean, in some sense, you know, one, one idea is that like the court's trying to compare like homology stuff and representation theory stuff. That's a, a very, high level perspective on what, what's happening here. And, and the main question that one tends to ask about this map or, or other maps, other related maps, is you know, how close is the assembly map or your favorite assembly map to being an equivalence? Think of it as sort of a, an approximation um, <clears throat> and you want to know, of course, how good is your approximation? So that's, that's the kind of question you ask. Um, so here are some more specific kinds of ways of saying this, 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 this question. So for example, maybe the K-theoretic uh, Novikov conjecture asks, you know, is this uh, rationally a split equivalence or oh, sorry, a split injective, excuse me, which is, and um, for example, Buckstedt, Shang, and Max, Madsen prove that the answer is yes, is the homology of G has finite type. So Yes, the homology. So this, you know, this is depending on your group. Um, so that's one kind of, you know, assembly is, it's not quite an equivalence, but it's, it's telling you about how good this approximation is. Um, another 
example of a similar kind of question is that, you know, the Farrell Jones conjecture, uh, this is about asking about a non connective version of this map. So this asks if a non connective version. Um, is an isomorphism or maybe a rational isomorphism or maybe just, you know, rationally injective, something like this um, for, again, for certain groups. And, and there's been lots of excellent recent work on, on the Farrell Jones conjecture, um, including like uh, Bartels, Luke, and Reich, who show that it's true for all hyperbolic groups. Um, <clears throat> So, true for hyperbolic groups in the sense of Gromov. Um, and then just like lots and lots and lots of other work here. So, lots of work along these kinds of, kinds of things. Oh, that should be an exclamation point and not a question mark. There really is a lot of work here. Oh. Definitely. <clears throat> so these assembly maps, we think about them as, as, you know, approximations, and sometimes they're good approximations, and sometimes they're not so good approximations, but we're interested in how good of approximations are they, and, and the sort of a whole family of related kinds of assembly constructions. So as I said, today I want to generalize what we're thinking about. This is sort of thinking about K-theory as a thing we do to rings. And I want to generalize K theory as not a thing we do to rings, but a thing we do to Lavier theory. So to thinking about K theory as an invariant of Lavier theories. And in order to tell you about that generalization, I should start by telling you about what are Lavier theories um, and, and why this is a reasonable thing to, to try to do. So that's the next thing that I'll, that I'll talk about with your theories. But before I do that, I um, just want to see if there are any questions. OK. So Levere theories. So what are, what are Levere theories? Well, really, I should think of a Levere theory. I want to think of it as like a general way of encoding algebraic structure. So when I think about algebraic structure, I think about things like modules over a ring um, or being a group, things like that. Um, there's, this is one of several different ways that you can try to encode algebraic structure. Um, one could compare things like operads or monads, which are also categorical gadgets designed to encode algebraic structure for you. Um, <clears throat> and Levere theories are different from both of these. Uh, there are some things that you can encode with Levere theories that you can't encode with operads, say, for example, the theory of, of groups is not encodable by an operad, but you can do it in Levere theories. And the way that they work is you specify the algebraic structure by specifying the, the free objects with that sort of structure um, together with the the maps between these three objects. So those are encoding operations. So you specify free objects on, on finally many generators for any n. So on n generators with whatever that structure is. And then together with operations relating these. So that's like pretty hand wavy. Let's give some concrete examples. Um, so one, if R is a ring, I can look at the category of free R modules. So those are like R modules of the form, you know, R direct sum with itself and times for every n greater than or equal to zero. Um, so this is together with the, the maps of R modules between these. 
And this actually, this category gives me the Levere theory of R modules. So this is encoding the structure of being a module over my favorite ring R. Um, <clears throat> a similar kind of example is if G is a group, um, I can look at the category of free G sets. So these are our G set sets with G action of the form, the disjoint union of G with itself and time. Again, you know, for any N greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and this gives me the Levier theory of G sets. Uh, and a very important special case of this one is the case when G is the trivial group. So if G is trivial, uh, then this just gives me the Levere theory of sets, um, which is uh, an, a very important Levere theory uh, that plays a, a special role in, in the overall structure. <clears throat> so those are maybe examples of, of sort of the same type, you know, you kind of feel like we know what free R models are and free G sets. Um, a maybe slightly different sort of example is the category of uh, free groups on N generators. So if I take the free group on N generators Fn, you can take the category of only free groups and like group homomorphism. And this gives me the Levere theory of groups. Um, sorry, just may I ask a question? Yes. So in the case of set theory, for example, how different is it from usual set theory? This, this is, so this, in the case of set theory, so like if I take in my, the example two, where G is the trivial right. group, right. I'm, let me tell you, let me say one more thing about like how these are encoding stuff. And then, then maybe I'll, I'll try to answer your question then. Okay, sure. Um, so I have these, you know, I have these categories. But the, I told you that like my Levere theory is supposed to encode like some sort of algebraic structure. In the case of sets, the algebraic structure is no additional structure. I think of that as like zero structure. How do I encode, you know, an arbitrary group or an arbitrary G set from this? Um, I encode it as a pre-sheaf on this, this category of my free thing. So an arbitrary object. Arbitrary object with whatever structure I'm interested in is encoded as a pre-sheaf. Um, on out of this category. Like into into the category of sets or something. And so what what's happening and then I um, <clears throat> so what's happening is that I'm really like I pick out the image of of the trivial set of the set, set with one element, and that's going to be my my arbitrary set that I can get, or the image of like the G set with just one copy of G, and that's going to be my my arbitrary G set. And then the you know have some some compatibility conditions, and the the morphisms in this category will produce for me like a G action and things like that. So so the theory of sets that I get out of this structure is just like I have sets. Um, no, it's not like a fancy, funny set theory. Um, <clears throat> and maybe I'll just say, just say like, what's the general setup that that these examples are are an instance of? And uh, sorry, the general... one, one, one more question. Sorry. Okay. So, is there is there any good notion of like free fields on n generators, for example, in this theory? I don't know. Yeah. I. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's a good example or not. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be very interesting to have a notion of free fields. I mean, yeah, yeah, and then in particular, you could have the field with one object, right, with one element. I was not thinking about that, but I was <laughs> just uh, just thinking as like non-commutative, uh, like metamorphic functions uh, and non-commutative torus and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Thank you. Well, well, we can discuss maybe later. Thank you. Sure. So the general setup that, that I'm looking at here is that for me, a Levere theory uh, is 
uh, so we'll call it T, that's it's the data of a functor. So which I'll, I'll call T as well from E is, is a, I'll tell you what E and F sub T are in a second. So here uh, E is a skeleton of the category of finite sets. And T, so category the finite sets, like if I take a skeleton of it, it really just looks like the natural numbers. And I have a nice, yeah, you know, I think of a disjoint union of finite sets or like adding in the natural numbers. And so that gives me a nice um, sum or co-product operation here. And I require that T be sum or you know, co-product, depending on how you like to think about it, preserving. So I'm implicitly requiring that the target have a notion of sum. And I also require that it be surjective on objects, which is like kind of a crazy thing from a categorical perspective. But really what it's telling me is that like, all I have is like for every N, I have the free thing on that number of generators, the free thing on N generators, because it's surjective on objects. So this is a way of sort of formalizing the idea that in my category, I just have a thing for every natural number. And that thing is going to represent the free whatever on, on that many objects. What's going to happen? <clears throat> okay, so that's Olivier theory. There's there's a couple choices that you're making here. If in this particular definition, then I've I've made them so that things are very strict um, by requiring that I I'm taking skeletons everywhere. I I didn't make that super explicit, but but that's a nice thing to do. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes people require products versus co-products, but it doesn't really matter what you do. You, it's, it's a simple duality choice. What I want to observe, though, is that in particular, uh, every Levere theory T comes with a choice of symmetric monoidal category, and that's this FT. So T gives us a symmetric monoidal category Uh, FT. And so this is what we can use to define the K theory of, of T. So here's the definition. So T is a Levere theory. Then we'll define the K theory of T to be the K theory of, I take this, this category, FT, this was like the category of free objects with my T structure. I'm going to restrict to the subcategory of isomorphisms because that's, that's how we usually do K theory. Um, and I'll just take the algebraic K theory of the symmetric monoidal category. So this is the algebraic K theory space of a symmetric monoidal category. And while, uh, K theory was originally defined as a thing that you do to rings. Really, the way that it that it comes from the things you do to rings is you take the symmetric monoidal category of modules over your ring, and and you can construct K theory that way. There's a couple different formalisms that work well here. Um, um, Anne Marie, can I ask you, you a question? So when you define this uh, this Lever theory as a frontal covariant frontal, mm -hmm. this looks like a little bit more restrictive than uh, what is a gamma set, in fact, uh, because a gamma set is a covariant frontal from the, the opposite uh, of the Seagull category. So here we deal again uh, with the finite pointed sets, two sets actually pointed. Actually, what is the point? I mean, because uh, I mean, I'm, I'm used to, uh, to be uh, always uh, be restricted to uh, small categories which are pointed initially to a final object. And here, I since I don't see, especially in the definition that you have just written, which carry to, I mean, implies K theory, I would have expected that, that uh, you might implement a pointed, a point, a point somewhere. <laughs> so, oh, so, um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so, so one thing here is that, uh, you know, gamma and gamma gamma spaces and gamma categories can come up in a couple different ways. And the way that that E, my category of finite sets, is coming up is 
is different from the way that we usually think about the gamma category coming up when we're doing like mm -hmm. Siegel style algebraic K theory, for example. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a, a precursor to that. So what, what this is doing is it's, um, it's, it's picking out for me, like one way to think about how I could get such a Lavier theory here, this is like kind of a crazy thing is I could say, suppose I have any nice symmetric monoidal category and I pick my favorite object. And then I could look at that object and then like, you know, sums of that object with itself as many times as I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, really okay. any category with co-products. Mm -hmm. And that would actually give me a Lavier theory here. I would just be able to like restrict the domain of that, that functor to, to just the image of my, my thing direct sum with itself mm -hmm. as many times as I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in any category with co-products, I could do that. Um, when I'm taking the, the K theory of, of this, this category, uh, then the unit object in the category plays a special role. Uh, and the unit object here is the image of zero, the image of the empty set. Understood, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Right, so, so this is actually maybe a good point to, a good spot to, to make the point that, you know, there's many models of how you could get the algebraic K theory space that are, that are all equivalent. Um, so coming, if you start with a symmetric middle category, um, I want to highlight maybe two of them that, that are useful in different ways. So one very, very classically is Quillen's plus construction. Um, So Quillen's plus construction, it's, it's relating K-theory to automorphism groups of, of the objects here. So, you know, if, if the objects of my fun category FT here, if these are called, you know, T1 is the image of, of one and T2 and T3, et cetera, et cetera. We get automorphism groups of these guys. T1, automorphism of T1 gives me an automorphism of T2 just by saying, well, like, don't do anything on the next generator, just like be fixed on the, the, the additional generator and, and do your previous automorphism on the generators you already have. Maybe this is not exciting when you go from T1 to T2, but from T2 to T3, it's a little more exciting. So you get what we'll call um, odd infinity of T, that's the co-limit here. The odds of the TNs. And um, <clears throat> Then we can show that like the, the higher K theory, uh, so, oh, sorry. Um, we can show that uh, K of T, the K theory space is, well, it's, it's just the set, whatever the K zero of set, set is, um, cross with uh, the classifying space of the automorphisms of, the infinite automorphisms of T, but with Quillen's plus construction, this is like the, the standard thing. So, you know, in the case where like T is the set theory of R modules, what do you get here? You're looking at like, you know, GL infinity of, of R, and this is the classic Quillen K theory. So this is, you know, Quillen's uh, classic definition. Um, and then similarly, so here, maybe I'll say these are examples. Um, <clears throat> when T equals uh, sets, then uh, you're looking at your, your sequence of automorphism groups are like, you know, the symmetric group on one element mapping to the symmetric group on two elements, et cetera, et cetera, to the symmetric group on three elements. So your, your infinite, uh, automorphism group is sigma infinity. And um, <clears throat> then work of, of Siegel tells you that the, the K theory here, so the K theory of, of sets, this should be, well, this should be like, you know, the pi n of B sigma infinity plus. And work of Siegel tells us that this is the uh, homotopy groups of the sphere spectrum. So these are the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So this is supposed to be the sphere spectrum. 
And then similarly, if you look at the theory of G sets, so that's like, you know, I had my two cases where G was the trivial group or G was an arbitrary group. Um, Siegel's work also tells you and either Siegel or maybe that's the Barrett pretty equivalent theorem, depending on how you like to think about it, that this is really going to give you the suspension spectrum of the classifying space of G. <clears throat> so that's a, those are some nice examples. Uh, another example we looked at is where T, you can look at it as where T is the theory of groups. So, right, so this is like your TN is the free group on N elements. And here, work of Soren Galatius. Uh, tells you the surprising fact that the K theory of groups, which again, you can compute by this stable, stable homology, like classifying space stuff. This is actually also, I guess at level N, this is also the, the sphere spectrum. So they're also giving you the stable homotopy groups of spheres. This is like way surprising and super cool. It's a really beautiful computational result about um, free groups due to, due to Soren Galatius. Oh, very surprising. Um, but, but in general, the point I want to make is that Quillen's, the Quillen's plus construction interpretation of K-theory and this connection to automorphism groups gives you a certain amount of computational access here. I mean, K-theory is hard to, generally you should think K-theory is like hard to compute, but you get a little bit of computational control here. So here are some other uh, cool examples you can do. Um, you can have T is the theory of Cantor algebras um, of area DA. So these are like sets x with a bijection um, from a copies of x down to x. Right, so obviously, x is not finite. Um, <clears throat> and then Schimmick and Vall, so Schimmick and Natalie Vall, they show that the k theory of Cantor algebras here, uh, this is the sphere spectrum mod a minus one, this is the Moore spectrum. Um, and uh, one other example is that I can let T be the theory of Boolean algebras, um, another nice algebraic structure. And then we know that the K theory of Boolean algebras, so this is this is due to, to me and, and Schimmick. Uh, the K theory of Boolean algebras, um, <clears throat> This is uh, the n3n. This is the set n stable homotopy groups of spheres, but mod two power torsion. So mod any torsion of a power of, with an order of a power of two. Um, so these are you really can use sort of stable homology kind of calculations and stable homology uh, arguments to understand something about these k-theory groups. Uh, I guess I, I wanted to point out for the Cantor algebras, one of the reasons this is an interesting, an interesting example is that the automorphism groups here give you um, the Higman Thompson groups. So these are cool. So these are, you know, automorphisms here are Higman Thompson groups. And that's where that's where this calculation is coming from is um, Schimmick and Wall's work on Higman Thompson groups. <clears throat> Okay, so you get some actual understanding of like what these what these k-theory groups and what these k-theory spectra are, and they they have all these like interesting relationships to the sphere spectrum, which as an as an algebraic topologist I always find really cool. So here, so now I want to like bring these algebraic k-theory groups of Levier theories. I want to bring them into the context of assembly. So here's a theorem that uh, Marcus Schimmick and I proved. So suppose you're given two Levier theories, S and T. Uh, you get a map of spectra of the following form. So it's either of spectra or of infinite loop spaces take your pick, whichever context you like better, from the k-theory of S, smash the k-theory of T, to the k-theory of what I'll call S tensor T. Uh, so S tensor T 
let me say is that this is the, what's called the Kronecker tensor product um, of the two Levier theories. And so it's S tensor T is another Levier theory, and its job is to model S algebras in the world of T algebras, so things with S structure in the world of things with T structure, or vice versa, it, it commutes. T algebras and S algebras and S algebras and T algebras are the same. So represents, uh, I guess, S modules in T modules or vice versa. Um, and so let me make this a little bit more concrete. So we can take in a special example, right? We could take S equals Z modules, modules over the, the integers, and T equals G sets. So this is the thing where the, the objects were the free G sets of however many generators. Um, and then uh, S tensor T here, this is the th theory of Z adjoined G modules. You, I mean, I'm looking at G sets in the world of modules over the integers, and so those are Z adjoined G, G modules. And we then, if we apply our theorem here and to get to this map, what are we getting? We're getting this map uh, from the K theory of Z uh, smash with, well, we've just said that as an example, the K theory of G sets is BG, suspension spectrum of BG to the K theory of Z adjoined G modules. And this is this is the low day assembly map. Is there some hypothesis missing in the theorem? I mean, obviously that you have like trivial maps, but there should be some statement that this map is non-trivial. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, it's not a hypothesis, maybe it's a, it's a conclusion. So you get a map of infinite loop spaces. Let me tell you, let me say, where does it come from? This is really, part of a, um, uh, this is a lax monoidal functor from the category of Levere theories to the category of spectra. So this is, this is the key structure uh, of a lax monoidal functor. And you can like figure out what it does on, you know, pi zero and, and stuff. Um, So, right. In regular, we know it's not the we know it's not the trivial map. <clears throat> um, I should say, like, uh, if you if you have spent a lot of time thinking about the structure of algebraic K theory, this should be a ridiculous assertion that this is a lax monoidal functor because there's a a lot of very complicated, tricky stuff going into trying to make K theory into something that's like properly a lax monoidal functor. So usually you either have to like pass to a two or maybe an infinity categorical world to get this state, this kind of a statement, or you have to be very fiddly with pairings. And there's a long history of people being very fiddly with pairings in ways that are not quite, quite right, but are morally right. Um, and so making, making proper sense of this is a little bit tricky. The thing that is amazing in this case is that, uh, Levere theories are actually asymmetric monoidal category. They're symmetric monoidal one category. And this is a functor of, this is a one functor. It is not a, not a functor of two categories. It's not a functor of infinity categories. This is an honest to goodness lax monoidal functor of one categories. And um, it's, it's sort of amazing that the strictness works out here for you. Uh, and that, that's something very beautiful about Levere theories that, that they're simultaneously super flexible but also you just have to deal with one category. You don't have to deal with like a lot of higher category theory, which is convenient. It's a lot easier to count to one than infinity. So, so that's really cool. <clears throat> At the beginning, you, you brought up uh, this pre-sheaf point of view. Um, where, where this uh, pre-sheaf point of view plays a role? Um, in, or where is visible? Uh, what is the appreciation that we get from the sheaf theoretic point of view? So, so this is this is the thing is that you're you're not really seeing the pre sheaf. So, like, if you wanted to get you know uh, a general set with an action of your favorite group G, you would take a pre sheaf, 
from this ca the category that I'm using to, to define K theory, you take a pre sheaf out of that category into sets, and that would <clears throat> that would give you the your general G uh, G set. But when you're not looking at those, so you're only looking at the free objects here when you're mm. defining the K-theory and you, you're not seeing those more general objects and, and the pre-sheaves there. Um, mm. This is, you think that this is like, it sounds like you're throwing a lot of stuff out, but in fact, that's what we do classically when you take the K-theory of a ring, um, you either restrict to either free or projective modules that only affects pi zero, it only affects the zeroth level K-theory. And so you can restrict to free modules and all the higher K-theory information is really in the, in the world of the free modules. Um, and it doesn't care about your crazy non-injective, non-projective, terrible module that you hooked up. Mm. You can't see that in the in the definition of K-theory. Um, mm. So yeah, and that's that's one of the things that makes these Levere theories um, that makes them them work and makes you get this like nice one categorical stuff is that you've you're really focusing on a, a small piece. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, right, so as I said, there's like some tricky stuff here. I should say that to get, to get the, the underpinnings right, we use constructions of K-theory due to Elmendorf-Mendel, um, and then a slight modification due to Johnson and Yao, uh, just, to, just to give credit where credit is due in, in making sure that you really get the K-theory structure that you want here. But, uh, Maybe the, the point I want to make here is here we, we looked at the special case where I was taking my, my S to be Z modules and my T to be G sets, and I got like the low day assembly map. But now we can see that we can this frees us up and we can talk about assembly for an arbitrary Levier theory T. So I don't have to choose T equals to G sets, I could choose T equals to any Levier theory I want. So we can now ask about. Uh, assembly for our favorite Levier theory T. Right, so <clears throat> we'll look at, you know, Z modules, the, the target here is gonna be, have to be the theory of Z modules, tensor the theory of, of T, the K theory of that. Um, this is something that, that is known as the linearization of T linearization of the theory T. And it's given by, you can, you can show, show that it's actually a theory of modules over a ring. Um, and we call that ring Z adjoint T, even though, you know, that, that doesn't, it's not really Z adjoint a group, right? It's Z, but we call it Z adjoint T. And so we get a, an assembly map um, from the K-theory of Z, smash the K-theory of T to the K-theory, oops, I'm squeezing my K, my K-theory of Z adjoint T. <clears throat> and here, um, notice that I'm, I'm, I'm using uh, in several spots, right, that if I actually have a ring, then the Levier theory of the, the, the Levere theory giving modules over that ring, its K theory is the same as the K theory of R modules, like just the K theory of R to begin with. So this really is a generalization of the classical K theory of a ring. And so then you can ask about like, what the heck happens with these assembly maps? So here are some results about how these assembly work, these assembly maps work. So one, Assembly for T equals Cantor algebras of Arity A, this is an equivalence. So you, you identify these with, you identify what's going on with both on both sides with um, something to do with Levitt algebras. And, and you can calculate that both sides have to give you the, the same thing. <clears throat> So I should say these are results of, of uh, me and Marcus Schimmick. So that's cool, right? Here's assembly being an equivalence. This is 
what we were you're sort of generally hoping is that this is a nice approximation. Maybe it's an equivalence. Uh, sometimes it's not so good, though. We can also prove that, on the other hand, assembly for Boolean algebras is just zero. Um, <clears throat> it's like not even a rational equivalence. It's just zero. Uh, so particular is not a rational equivalence or a rational injection or a rational anything you might like. Definitely not a rational equivalence. So here, uh, it turns out that Z tensor uh, Boolean algebras, this is the theory of modules over the trivial ring. Uh, and so that means that the target of this map is zero. K theory of Z tensor Boolean algebras is just zero. This is a contractible space. Okay. So, I mean, and, and you should just expect that like, Levier theories are very, very general. They encode a whole bunch of different stuff. And so it's like totally unreasonable that, that you would get an equivalence in all cases or even something vaguely resembling an equivalence in all cases. But, but you can like, ask about what happens in specific cases and sort of get a sense of like what how these two sides are related in a little more flexibility than than you were thinking when you were only looking at groups another case we can analyze this this in fact you know basically follows from <clears throat> the the calculations of galatius if we look at T equals the theory of groups. So again, right, this is the one where the objects in this category are free groups. Um, this is an equivalence. Right, so here, again, so the interesting, the thing you have to compute to think about the, the uh, right-hand side is that you need to look at the tensor of the Levier theory for Z and the Levier theory for groups, right? So what should this be? This should represent group objects in, in Z modules, so that's groups in abelian groups, but those are just actually abelian groups. So this is uh, abelian groups. And of course, as we know, abelian groups, we can also, these are just Z modules. Um, <clears throat> so our assembly map here is like K theory of Z uh, smash the K theory of groups. Uh, saying this is an equivalence is saying that this is the same as the K theory of, of Z, which is Z modules, right? And here, you know, Galatius' work tells us that this is the sphere spectrum, which is the unit for the smash product. So these, these two sides, you calculate the two sides separately and you can see that they're the same. And then with a little more work, you trace through and you see that, that the map is the identity. Um, I guess that in particular proves for us that, that this map is not generally zero, uh, which is not so bad. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so assembly for, for groups here is an equivalence. Here's another example where we can try to understand assembly. And here is another, it's another example where, where things are not so close to being an equivalence. So we could have T be uh, what we'll call nil C. So this is nil potent groups of class C. So you can also, encode, you know, so you can encode abelian groups as a modules of Levier theory, but, and also like all groups, but then you can sort of interpolate between these by like looking at nil potency classes of groups. So these are nil potent groups of class, you know, C is equal to one. Um, this is not rationally injective. Um, <clears throat> and this follows from the fact that uh, Marcus Schimmick proved uh, previously that rational homology of the K theory of nil potent groups of class C, this is um, non trivial for any C. Um, so let's see. This follows from Schimmick's work on. Um, well, I mean, maybe we should say, think about it as his work was on the, the stable homology of um, groups of particular no potency classes. Mm. 
<clears throat> so this is non-trivial. So, right. So really what I, what I want to point out here is that we have a whole lot of different, very different kinds of examples that we can put into our sort of generalized assembly framework once we've we've shifted from from k theory being a theory of uh, of rings to having it be a theory that we apply to to Levere theories. Sorry, the word theory appears in like twelve different spots here. So you get a lot of these assembly maps. You can analyze some of them. Sometimes you get an equivalence. Sometimes you very much don't get an equivalence. It's kind of what you would anticipate. <clears throat> but one other cool thing about, about our result is that you know, all of these kinds of assembly maps, what, what happened to get them, what we did to get them is we said, let's take the groups, like the, the, co the part of low days assembly map that corresponds to my favorite group, and let's like let that be a general of your theory. So we're replacing our favorite group with our favorite Levier theory. Um, so right, so these results are about changing our group for a general Levier theory. So we're changing the G, or you know maybe the the G set factor. Um, in low days math for a general linear theory. But the other thing to point out is that the Z factor also arises as the K theory of a Levere theory. So, but the Z uh, is also uh, a K theory of a Levere theory term. And this is the K theory of the Levere theory of Z modules is how, how I was thinking about it. So we can change that. We, all of the terms that are coming up in this, this assembly map here, they're all the same kind of thing. And we can put any Levere theory we want in sort of like any spot is the idea. So we can swap that. I mean, of course, you could change it to your favorite modules over some other group if you want, or over some other ring, excuse me, if you wanted. Um, that wouldn't be so crazy, but you can change it much more radically. So, for example, you could do something like this. You could ask about what's the K theory of the Lefeuille theory of groups, smashed with the K theory of T. Like, think about this as assembly over groups. So, this should map to the K theory of the tensor product of the theory of groups and your favorite Levier theory T. And, and I want to think about this as like, you know, what am I doing when I'm replacing Z with groups? Well, really, I should think I'm replacing, I'm replacing Z modules with free groups. So I'm replacing abelian groups with groups. So in some sense, what I'm doing now is I'm asking that instead of having an assembly be from something about like the K theory of abelian groups, like trying to approximate something about like that, now I'm getting to use the K theory of of non, not necessarily abelian, not necessarily commutative groups here. <clears throat> so it's like a, a decommutivization or something, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, you know, we know that this is uh, by Galatius's result, we know what the K theory of groups are. This is just um, the sphere spectrum. So this is isomorphic to uh, a map coming from the K theory of T to the K theory of groups tensor with k t. Um, <clears throat> since uh, by Galatius's result, we know that the k theory of, of groups themselves is the sphere spectrum. And we can also think that, you know, groups are pretty general and abelian groups are, well, they're also general, but they're pretty special. And so we could look at like a tower of interpolations. Uh, and here I'm, I'm really, I'm finishing here with some, uh, some interesting questions and the questions I don't have the answers to, but but that I think are are neat points of view you can get out of this shift. So you can look at like you know you have abelian groups, and of course there's a map from from groups to abelian groups. Um, <clears throat> you get a tower of like interpolations of between 
the groups of various nil potency classes like this. Um, <clears throat> and the point is that I can, I can swap in my like first term, my Z factor term of the uh, assembly map, I can put any of these things in. So I should, I can get something that's like, you know, the K theory of Z smash the K theory of T for my favorite linear theory T to the K theory of, you know, this linearization, Z adjoint T. But I also have like the K theory of no potent groups of no potency class two, smash the K theory of T to the K theory of groups of no potency class two, tensor with T. And, you know, the same thing at any other level. Uh, So I have sort of a whole family of these kinds of assembly maps. <clears throat> and so, you know, open question that you might get from these things are things like, you know, does the tower of, of spectron K theory, so does the, the tower of Levere theories up here on the left, um, does this give uh, give uh, a tower in spectra that converges to the K theory of groups? And, and that's the sphere spectrum. So is this another tower that is a tower of spectra that's computing for us something about the sphere spectrum? And that's cool. We always want to know more stuff about the sphere spectrum. I guess this would start with the K theory of Z, which isn't the most suspicious starting point, but, but we know some stuff about that. So maybe you could do worse. Maybe you could go backwards and forwards. And then, you know, relatedly, uh, does the tower after I like, you know, smash with, with the Levere theory of my favorite other K theory. So does like the tower of K nil potency smash K of T converge to K of groups, smash K of T. Or maybe on the other side, you know, does K theory of nil potent, groups of nil potency class C tensor with my favorite other random of your theory T, maybe this depends on T, right? Does this converge to uh, the K theory of groups, tensor with T? Uh, <clears throat> You know, and if so, then now you could have you could think of having like a tower of assembly maps that you're trying to understand, and maybe you understand like the bottom one where things are are really groups, or maybe you understand the top one where uh, maybe the top one here where I'm looking at the K theory groups. Maybe that one's easier to understand because it's the, the sphere spectrum, which is the K theory groups, is not it's not hard, but it's I mean it's hard to know the homotopy groups, but it is the unit object for this match product there. So so maybe this map is a little simpler. You could ask, like, you know, how far down the tower could I be? Could I be pushing things? So this gives us sort of a, a very different way to think about how to to generalize assembly style maps and and different kinds of questions that we could ask about them. And and I certainly don't have the answers to to all of these questions, but I think it's a it's a neat new perspective on on what's happening here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anne Marie. Very nice talk. Um, Yes. <laughs> um, uh, any, you have any question uh, or comment for Anna Marie? Sure. Can I ask a couple of questions? Um, Please go ahead. So, um, one question: Does does Hermitian K theory or um, or L theory? Uh, fit into your framework? Um, I'm not sure. So our, our basic framework is that when we mean K-theory, we mean K-theory of, of a symmetric nodal category. Right. These are particularly nice symmetric nodal categories. So... So those usually come as K-theory of uh, modules with a, like a, with a self-duality, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, Mm 
Right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can encode the self-duality in, in the structure of a Levere theory. Like it doesn't seem totally crazy. Um, like you can definitely have, you know, interesting like endomorphisms of, or endomorphisms of your, your like free thing on one generator that, that those come up as operations in your Levere theory and you could encode them that way. But I'm not, I'm not totally sure whether you could really get all the structure you wanted there for Hermitian. Uh, yeah, I was just asking because that gives you lots of very interesting examples of assembly. Yeah, for sure. Um, second question is um, the way you define K of T, I take it just gives the connective K theory spectrum, right? So you don't get a non-connective yeah this is this is really getting out cover of which is um so for example assembly um you often are very interested in the non-connective version yeah it doesn't yeah. doesn't the assembly fails to give an equivalence often simply because of the negative k groups mm -hmm. uh, and the truncation effect so i don't know how you can sort of build that back in yeah i mean so so one thing you might try to do is like when you're building non-connective things is try to, you know, you sort of like parameterize your mm -hmm. categories and, and try to like take K-theory of, of those categories. And I haven't thought about whether you could use those same techniques. Um, right. I mean, there are various kinds of ways of doing that. There's a yeah. Wagoner approach, there's a peterson level approach, there's... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I think there's... That, that's a good question. I mean, you would really like for a lot of examples to be able to get at more of the non-connected things, but this this structure, um, it's very yeah. kind of relevant, but it's definitely definitely very connected. Right. And then a third question is, what about uh, so some of the most interesting examples of K theory come from uh, K theory of let's say categories of. Uh, vector bundles of coherent sheaves over uh, over a scheme. Um, so I don't know how you fit those into this theory. Uh, yeah, those are also like a, a pretty different. That's, I mean, I, I guess those are those are algebraic K theory, but I think of them as like the algebraic K theory that's that's trying to get get at topological K theory ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I think of. I mean, I guess I think of vector bundles over a manifold and I'm like, great, okay, that's, that's the job of topological key theory. Um, and so there you do need, you wanna include, incorporate some sort of topology and, and this, is, this is forgetting that because it's really just thinking about, uh, it's really just thinking about the symmetric modal category. It's very, it's very combinatorial. Um, so, you're, so you're missing some of those kinds of things. Um, on the other hand, I don't know what happens if you you just take a um, algebraic variety, uh, define these sort of free objects just to be uh, things like uh, you know the sort of standard standard locally free sheaves and. I don't know if you get anything interesting when you do that. Uh, yeah, I, I also don't know if you get anything interesting if you do that. Um, I was just wondering if you'd thought about that at all. Right. No, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you have, if you have, like, I guess I was thinking about these as, as coming from um, structures that are, that are like, you know, more like the structure of, of the groups or something where I have like an algebraic, you know, an algebraic gadget thought of as like a set with some operations. Like that's the, the classical um, motivating kind of example for Levere theories is you're like, okay, I want my algebraic structure to be, I have a set and I have some, some operations on my set and they satisfy some axioms and I want to understand how do, I, how do I encode like all sets with this kind of, kind of structure. Um, so then you're led more towards the idea of groups or abelian groups or, or these like Cantor algebras and things like that. 
But, but as I said, the definition works if you have any, you know, all you need is like a category with co-products and then you can take your favorite object there and just take like self co-products with itself, with co-products with itself as many times as you want. And now you have a Levere theory. Um, I, you'd have to then ask, what does it mean to take modules or algebras over this Levere theory? Like what kind of algebraic structure is it encoding? Uh, and that's a question I don't know the answer to. Uh, any more comments or questions? In fact, you said at the start uh, some um, some arithmetic applications. Uh, 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 in which sense? Uh, which one uh, view did you have in mind? Um, I was thinking of these these like applications to to assembly to like thinking about what happens in these generalized assembly things. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, that was that was applications in the very abstract sense of what we're applying things to. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I it was. Uh, I mean, it's certainly interesting to see that the K theory of the bool uh, is um, is the stable of the P theory of sphere modulo yeah. two torsion. What is behind uh, and uh, and then. Uh, for a reason which may be intuitively uh, yes, I mean one can guess when you take uh, the tensor with Z, the K theory of Z tensor the bool, and then I just banish. I mean this, uh, uh, you get this uh, this ring. Uh, I mean, trivial ring. Um, in the first uh, your theorem uh, about the K theory of bool. A little bit of comment on that theorem, what is uh, behind this uh, result? Yeah, so, so it's, it's coming from a, a, a stable homology calculation. Um, and you, you like analyze what the, the homology, the stable homology has to be of these automorphisms on the Boolean algebras. Um, and you, it's actually, this is, this is really like one of a family of results where um, if you're familiar with um, post algebras of an arbitrary arity, there's like generalizing, they usually come up in logic and they, they generalize Boolean algebras. If you think about Boolean algebras as having like, you know, you have two truth possibilities, then you can have as many as you want. Um, and these give you post algebras. Um, and in fact, if you have post algebras of like type N, what we can show is that the, um, the K theory of those post algebras is the sphere spectrum mod n power torsion. Um, so it's, it's something about like, you know, having maps, killing things of n power torsion because you have these n, n truth types. Um, and actually this is, this is like a thing that's, that's kind of fun about this is that all of these post algebras of all the different um, types n are all Merida equivalent in the world of Levere theories. And so this is telling you that, that this K theory is not uh, Merida invariant with respect to Merida equivalence of Levere theories. Um, so so that, that's why we were thinking about, I mean, that's how we ended up thinking about these particular examples is that, <laughs> at that okay. question. Okay. Um, any more question or comment before to close this talk? If I give a look around, if I see, no. Okay, so then uh, thank, let's thank Anne Marie again for uh, this nice uh, talk. And, uh, and um, I guess uh, we will uh, meet again next week for yes. uh, for the next uh, for the next speak with the next speaker. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you to you all. Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you. Thank you.